But what I do in these communities is I go and I understand what the residents uh, want. I understand who they are. So I like talk to my neighbors. I've gone to events that are in, you know, third ward, uh, fifth ward, going in and just trying to like figure out what the community needs and like what the residents need. What are they pissed off about? Like, what are they happy about? And how I can help them determine, okay, like, uh, you know, the value of your home has gone up, but this is what you can do with it. Welcome to the Threefold Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is the podcast where you'll not only learn how you can achieve massive success in multifamily real estate investing, but also how you can simultaneously pursue great relationships with your family and a better walk with God. You can achieve financial freedom through real estate investing without sacrificing the relationships that mean the most to you. Now, here's your host, Lee Yoder. Welcome back, three full listeners. I hope you're having a great week. We've got a great guest joining us today. Nicole Gauthier is joining us from Houston, Texas. Uh, We'll bring her in here in just a minute. Um, A little bit about Nicole. She is the founder of Wicked Holdings, a real estate investment company focused on social change and community empowerment. She's a multifamily real estate investor, currently invested in 208 plus doors. She is a mommy of two and a woman dedicated to helping educate others on the concept of generational wealth and financial literacy. Uh, She provides opportunities for passive investors to diversify their assets into multifamily investments so they too can live a life of abundance and financial independence. I love all that uh, here at Threefold. We're we're trying to do uh, very similar things. So Nicole, very excited to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely, Lee. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, good. So, hey, Nicole, if you don't mind, take us back um, to when you first got into real estate. So what were you doing then? Um, you know, working full time, whatever, what were you doing? And then what first uh, got you excited about real estate or or made you think you might want to get into it like you are now? Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess the beginning of my real estate journey kind of started with, uh, you know, kind of what we all do, right? Some market research. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was, I'm big into history and Houston has a ton of uh, African-American history and communities that embody just some of the things that I'm really interested in. And so I was doing some research on one of the wards actually here in Houston that's been going through a lot of gentrification, um, a lot of new development that's been going in the area, but they also had a lot of history. And I'd gone into the communities uh, to kind of go to the African American Museum. Uh, There's a few of those actually that are uh, downtown Houston. And I don't know, I just was exploring opportunities and I came across Third Ward And um, I saw that prices were increasing and things were starting to become a little bit unaffordable. And so I kind of pulled the plug and was like, hey, you know what? I'm going to go and just buy this piece of land. I'm going to just buy this this lot inner city and I'm going to figure out what I want to do with it later. But I know that if I don't buy it now, that I probably won't be able to afford it a year from now. And so that was my kind of foot into the door in real estate. Wow. So really seeing an opportunity in an area. I mean, it's a local area. You know, you have a lot of advantages, but it's also a lot of fun to invest in your own area, in your own community that you believe in or that you want to make a difference in. Um, But yeah, I mean, obviously you have some market insight that outsiders don't have. So you saw this area gentrifying like, hey, this may be a good opportunity, but also I think I want to make an impact here. And so you just jumped right in. I mean, it's not that you didn't even have, you know, you didn't have A to Z planned out. You just, hey, here's A to B. Let me go ahead and make that move. And I'll figure it out. And, and I mean, but I think there's a lot to that, Nicole, in that, I mean, you got to be safe and hey, don't over leverage and don't lose it. But if you can hang on, you know, they always say like, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real, real estate and wait, like just go ahead and buy it. You'll figure it out real estate's a good investment. So you kind of jumped in, maybe take us to the next step. What, what did you do with that? Or what did you do next? Yeah, no. So it's funny. So I definitely did take that, that step. And I guess that, that jump into it, which is funny mm-hmm. because I have um, an oil and gas background as an accountant. And that's like literally like the safest job you could ever have. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> you're like thinking about risk and you're like, Oh, I'm not going to take this step. Cause it sounds kind of scary and whatnot. But I really learned quickly that in real estate, you have to like push that aside and mm-hmm. learn to take like more of those calculated risks. So after that point of um, buying the lot, I ended up getting into, um, I'd say at that, at that stage, I was kind of getting into like my first deal as a passive investor and closing on um, a 
my first rental at the same time. Okay. And um, so I will say that kind of my next biggest project that I ended up getting into was uh, a residential purchase. It was a rental, uh, basically my rental property, but a house yeah. that I had found uh, doing some direct seller marketing, got connected Ooh. with a wholesaler and uh, walked this property. And they were asking like way too much for it. So I said, yeah, no, like I'm going to pass on that. It doesn't make sense. That's like totally overbuying. Let me know if you guys reduce the price. And so it probably took about a couple of months and they came back to me and was like, hey, probate's about to um, get settled and, and cleared up on this property. And I said, okay, well, you know, what's your, what's your lowest, what's your lowest amount? Like, what do you, what are you kind of like looking for? And they told me, and it was like pretty close in line with what I had originally had told them like yeah. uh, two months prior to that. So that's when I was like, okay, like I'll come out, I'll take a more serious look at it. And, um, it, it, that ended up being a full gut rehab project. So a very yep. big one, but yeah. uh, lots of lessons learned. And yep. uh, you, you know, right? When yes. you get into your first first deal, what? your first flip, you're like, oh my gosh, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's really the best way to learn though. If you, you know, again, don't, don't over leverage, don't, don't take too much risk, but if you can, you know, you jump in and you, you learn as you're doing it. Um, yeah. And so getting in, so getting in actively buying a single family rental, uh, this was local too, I'm guessing. Yes, this was okay. local. And this was also in another distressed community that um, that I had kind of my my eyes on. It was not in Third Ward, but there Houston's got a lot of areas that are um, historically black or um, black communities as well as like distressed communities, like I guess you could say. And so this one kind of fell within there where you saw some of the same signals as Third Ward, my previous purchase, lots of yeah. gentrification. Okay new stuff coming in. Yeah. Good stuff. And are you working full time at this point, Nicole? No, I was not. Okay. I was actually, so, um, at the, at the time that I made my first purchase, I was a stay at home mom. So I wasn't working and I wasn't okay, great. Hadn't yeah. dove in deep into real estate yet at yeah. that point. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So working full time, raising humans. Yes. Raising but, yeah, humans. No, that I, was yeah. a full time stay at home mommy. Oh yeah. <laughs> the busiest job you can have the 24 seven job. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Okay, cool. So, uh, and maybe just tell us just a little bit about your passive investment, Nicole. How did you, um, get into that? You know, what was it through a community? Yeah. Just how, how did you jump in? What, what was it and how did you get into that? Yeah. So I actually ended up finding this passive investment through a friend of mine. So as we yeah. know, real estate, real estate is very, um, heavily based on relationships and your network. And yep. so at the time when, you know, I really kind of first getting started, um, in real estate, I was really, networking my butt off. So I was like yeah. talking to people, getting out there, doing some content creation, just trying to like learn more about the space. And um, I found that you can get, you know, passively invested into multifamily syndications. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard of syndications before. So I was like, what is this? So kind of during, through my research and stuff, I, I reached out to some different people and made a good uh, connection slash friendship now with one of the operators that I ended up doing the investment with. And uh, they just kind of told me about their deal and it fit in line with uh, where I wanted to go long-term. It yeah. was a little bit of an untraditional investment in that this one's like a 30 year hold with refis. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah, so refis kind of built in every three to okay. five years. But I was looking for very specific things like a refi early on so I could get my initial capital back and mm -hmm. continue to, you know, recycle money, mm -hmm. similar to BRRRRS, right? Um, and so, yeah, I just made a great connection with this person, loved the deal. It fit my goals and my investment metric. And I pulled the plug and was like, yeah, let's, let's go for it. So that's awesome. Yeah. Has that gone well? Has that been a good experience so far? Yeah, it has. And yeah. I will say... That like, you know, people sometimes think that they can only learn multifamily by being active, but there's so much to Good learn point. on the, on sure. you know, on the passive investing side. Like, for example, like PPMs, I had never heard of a private placement memorandum. I'm like, what is this? And so like yep. reading through that, I'll say like my husband saw me like reading, I, I ended up, this is, this is the accountant in me coming out. It was like <laughs> 148 pages and I'm like, okay. I every single one oh of these to gosh. make sure that like I know what it is that I'm doing and I did it took me like two weeks but I got through it and you're hired I want to hire you to read, read through ours <laughs> for me <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's not it's definitely not like the sexiest part about investing in, in real estate for sure but 
the great thing about passive investing is like once you've gotten through all of those like nitty gritty detail parts and you know, like, and trust the operator, then the rest of it's super easy. And you just yep. sit back and, you know, yep. you get your K1, you get excited about that. You get excited about your cash flow that's coming in uh, quarterly. So um, yeah, it's been a great experience. It's a good point, Nicole. I, I would suggest that people, I mean, I think passive investing is a great way to get started. Uh, just like you said, you can absolutely, you can get started quickly that way because people have deals. You don't have to go find your own and all that. So you can get started quicker, which I think, like I said, in real estate, like just buy real estate and wait, like get into it as quickly as you can. I think it's a great investment. So you can get in quicker. Um, but you need to be very active in getting in, right? Like you need yeah. to do your research on the operator, especially number one, but then even the market on the asset class, be active up front, And then, yeah, then you can sit back and be passive. Like you just explained there. It, it, yeah. Which is great. It's great to be passive, but you, you know, it's good to be active early on. I want to get into a little bit more of what you're, you're most excited about and, and what you're really putting your energy into, but just real quick, um, you, you've done both here so early on. What do you prefer active or passive? Maybe just some, some pros and cons. And, and I guess if you could choose going forward, uh, yeah. Which would it be? What do you prefer? Um, okay. So that's a really good question. I'll say I actually like both, but I like them for different reasons. Okay. So for me, I'm not the type of person that needs to know like all of the details all of the time, right? Yeah. We can only like be as active as time will allow us to be. And so that's why I purposely chose, okay, I'm going to passively invest in multifamily because I believe in this asset class, yeah. but I also do have the time because I'm in real estate full time and I love it to be active as well. And I love the relationships. Yep. I love connecting. I love underwriting, like all of that fun stuff. And so um, I'll say that I, I enjoy being active because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a passion of mine. It's, it's a, and I'd say a hobby too, I guess. Yeah. Um, you can be like, yeah, I say how hobby and passion. Um, but I really like talking to people too. So the capital raising part of it and using my brain to do the numbers and stuff like, and deal sourcing, that's what I really love about being active. For the passive side, I love it because I can still create generational wealth for my family mm -hmm. and have my money working for me in constant motion all of the time with people that I know, like, and trust that's also in multifamily as well or some other um, yeah, asset classes. It. So yep. that's why I like both of them for different reasons. And I'm also getting paid on the passive side without actually doing any of the work. I and know. that's amazing. Yes. Like, really amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, you laid it out so well. I mean, I... I would say a lot of those same things. I think there's some benefits you can get from being active that you just can't get as a passive investor, but vice versa. I mean, there are benefits to a passive investing. <laughs> Namely, you can be passive. You, know, that you, yeah. just, you can't <laughs> get from the active side. I think, I think maybe I pulled this off your, your website or something, but uh, you had said, I am ardent about empowering underserved communities and teaching others the valuable life skills of financial literacy so that they too can have the resources necessary to take action and experience growth. You, Nicole, founded Wicked Holdings with a mission to provide safe, stable, and loving homes for those in need. This was just really well said, so I just want to read it. But how are you accomplishing this goal? Or how are you hoping to accomplish this goal? Because I love, I love that goal. I, I grew up with very blessed, great parents, but knew nothing about real estate. You know, have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Yes, that's so, what turned yeah, me on real estate. Yeah, right. Me, so me too. So when I read that, I'm just like, gosh, how did nobody tell me about this? So I, I feel like almost everybody hasn't heard about this, but especially yeah. underserved communities and um, maybe minority communities, but just even just poor communities, they, they have no idea that there's this whole other game, that there's this a different game that wealthy people play. It's, it's not that they're playing a game better, that they're smarter, that they work harder all the time. I mean, and, and they probably ha are smart and do work hard, fine, but they also just play this completely different game that we don't know about. So, I, you know, not to steal any thunder. I want to hear your take on this. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, and it's funny because like, I just saw like in your face, like how excited you were about, you know, about, about all of it. And it's like, yeah. and I see the little purple book behind you too. Uh -huh. uh, mine's not behind me. It's in the, it's in the kitchen actually. But, <laughs> uh, but yes, it's like, it's, it is, it's like, it's one of those like newfound discoveries that you're like, ah, like that's what's really happening. Like, yeah, okay, sure. now that I know it, I'm going to go out and I'm going to share it with everyone. And I'm going to try to impact the lives of other people that perhaps they're, you know, their parents or their grandparents, they didn't have that knowledge and they couldn't pass yep. any of that down. Right. And as we know, knowledge is oftentimes generational. 
right? Yes. So we, yes. we learn different things than our parents do. And then we're able to pass that down to our kids. And then our kids are able to pass that down. But it all starts with you. It starts with someone at the top. And so that's why I specifically chose distressed communities, because I knew there that there are a lot of people that are sitting on gold mines for one. They don't even realize what their what their house is worth. Mm. They don't even realize that everything that's going around them, that that all of the new development and the new builds and everything that they see is actually increasing the values of their homes. But they're yeah. mad because they're like, oh, well, you know, it's it's destroying the community or it's doing this. And it's like the community doesn't look the same anymore. And I get that that's that's twofold, sure. right? Yep. Um, it's twofold in the sense that they could be mad because now their property tax their property values are increasing and so are their taxes. And maybe yep. they couldn't afford to pay their taxes already and they get displaced because of it. Yep. Um, so there's there's a lot of intricacies um, that, are, uh, that are involved, put it that way. But what I do in these communities is I go and I understand what the residents uh, want. I understand who they are. So I like talk to my neighbors. I've gone to events that are in, you know, third ward, uh, fifth ward going in and just trying to like figure out what the community needs and like what the residents need. What are they pissed off about? Like, what are mm -hmm. they happy about and how I can help them determine, okay, like, uh, you know, the value of your home has gone up, but this is what you can do with it. You can cash out refi. You can do this with it. You can, you know, there's, our minds are yes. always going, yes. but they don't know these things unless you tell them and unless you invest that time and, and start to kind of pump that financial literacy um, into them. It takes yeah. a little bit of strategy. And I can't say that there's like one thing like specific other than making sure that their houses are comfortable, that it's more than just four walls. Like they have heat, they have running water, they have, um, you know, updated uh, homes that are comfortable to live in that yep. they can be proud about versus the people that are maybe living down the street that are paying market rent and their house is halfway falling down. Yeah. It's like, and, and you see that, you see it everywhere. And yep, so that's I don't doubt it. Yep. Nope. Like I got to make some, I got to make some change and go in there and, and do that. Do things. My yeah. Way. One thing I've been thinking about Nicole and, and I, I'm, I don't have this figured out, so I don't have anything great to say about it, but um, it's tough because with where prices are today, um, often the, the goal is to buy C-class properties. Mm -hmm. and then turn them into B-class properties. And it's great. I love that investment model. Um, there's times I feel really bad about doing that because essentially, you know, we're displacing residents. Um, mm -hmm. We're saying, hey, if you want to live in a C-class property, you probably don't want to live in this property anymore because it's going to cost what a B-class property costs. That's one thing I would love to do. And again, sometimes I... I hate where prices are because it's very hard to do it. It's very hard to just say, well, I'm just going to buy a property, whether it's C-class or B-class, and just just keep rents where they are. I mean, yeah. it just yeah. it doesn't work with prices where they are today, right? So again, I, I don't have this figured out, but that's so frustrating to me because it used to be, Nicole, I feel like, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not that old. I, I think you are similar ages, but like, I know it used to be like, you just bought a property and the income was a little bit more than the expenses. And then you just paid off debt. And that was it. Like, you didn't have to be so aggressive, but now we're buying it. Like it's so competitive. You have to buy it. So it's like, just to justify that price, I really have to get the income up, but right? I can't just pay <laughs> yeah. down debt. Like I got to get up, you know, yeah. um, I've got interest only. And, and you know, at this um, revenue, I can hardly afford once I start paying principal. So I have to get that up. I have to turn it into a B class property, right? Like I just, I wish it wasn't that way. Um, it, it seemed like we could serve better if it wasn't. And this is just me complaining. Um, like I said, I don't have any answers yet, but I would love to um, just be able to invest a little bit differently. And maybe I'm getting there. I'm looking for opportunities like that. So I will say too, that I've done some research in this because I know that gentrification is kind of seen as like a good and a bad thing because sure. of, because yeah. of displacing, um, you know, residents and community yeah. people that have been there forever. But one of the things that, um, that you can kind of get around in, in displacing is um, for one, if you're able to charge less than market rent, say you've mm -hmm. got a property and you're able to get it off market and it didn't need that much rehab, then, you know, then you can kind of go in and it's not necessarily increasing the values as much where it's like appreciating everyone else's home, yeah. but you're still able to, you know, you're be a, you know, take care of your tenants in that way. Um, another thing that I had um, read about too, is that if you do like development, 
like you do new builds in the community, that you're actually adding on to the availability of housing in a community versus displacing. So yeah. that's kind of where that lot came in, where I was like, oh, okay, like now things are starting to make sense. If I develop, and, you know, and I build maybe like a duplex or, or something on there, or even do student housing, because it's right next to two universities in the area, yeah. that, um, you know, there's an opportunity there to be able to increase the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the livability conditions of those in the, in the neighborhood without necessarily displacing them. Um, yeah, good point. And sometimes those areas, those cities, will partner with you to make it even more, make it make sense. Right. Which yep, yep. sometimes it takes, cause it's hard. Like, another difficult part, Nicole, is that the cost to build sometimes mm-hmm. makes it so that it's hard to build and then charge C-class rent because right. you're into it for too much again. Right. Like again, that's where the price is. It's like, this is frustrating because it's hard to provide. It just, it's hard to provide C-class housing at that rate. Yeah. Like, no, I, I agree with that. And I think one of the things too, especially with this specific one is um, the where I had seen the opportunity when I was driving for dollars and originally had found the, the, the lot that way was um, that there was a student housing complex that's literally like right around the corner. Like you could walk there in, in less than a minute and it has not been updated, uh, cleaned up or anything probably for decades. I would say. Mm -hmm. So I did a little bit of research and was like, well, what are they charging for these, uh, for these dorms, like for these, for these units that are, you know, one unit and they have, um, I found out that they have four beds in them and they were charging like eight to $900 per bed and you've got four in each room. Can you imagine doing a new build and maybe tailoring it towards student housing, even if it's a single family, three-story townhome and you've got four or five bedrooms in there? Yeah. You can still make pretty good oh, rent by sure. not even increasing the amount of rent that you're, you know, that you're, I said, quote unquote, your competitors are, are charging, but you're giving them so much better of like a, a, a living environment and everything's brand new and they're still right next to their school. So yep. it's things like that. It's like, it really, you're, you're totally spot on where it is frustrating because you do have to solve a lot of problems, but it just takes a little bit more time. It's like thinking yeah. outside the box, like, okay, what can I do with this, this, and this? Yes. Just stay out of analysis paralysis is what I always say. Well, Nicole, um, because you're, you're in it, um, and, and I think a lot of people would love to make a difference, but some people may be, I don't know, nervous about investing in a C-class area. Mm-hmm. What, what's been your experience so far? What would you say to people that say, you know, hey, higher crime, um, higher vacancy, more evictions, you know, th- those would be some of the, the concerns with investing in C-class areas. What's been your experience? Uh, maybe others that you know, uh, what would you say about that? I would absolutely say that, um, you know, you can definitely go out and you can look at the crime statistics and whatnot in an area, but that doesn't mean that that is going to be specific to your location. Houston mm-hmm. is one of those areas where there's a ton of pockets of good areas and bad areas. And you could be out in River, o- River Oaks, which is like a very high affluent area. And you could be on a great street with a ton of like new development, new homes, million dollar homes, and then go like three blocks down to another way. And you're like, okay, I shouldn't be on this street. Mm-hmm. So that's why um, I'm a big proponent of just diving a little bit deeper into the research in, in, in an area. Yeah. Um, for these, both of these areas, I will say, yes, there might be higher crime, but the neighbors look out for you like no other. Yeah. You develop that relationship with them. You say hello to them. You come out and you just don't pretend like you're someone that you're not. And you just get down on their level. They yep. will watch Love your that. house like it's their own. Mm -hmm. And so I have not experienced anything that's been bad with like the different tenant base. They pay on time. Um, They uh, so far have been great to work with. Sometimes you could, you can get ones that are a little bit picky, but I've realized that that's, I'm learning, I guess we'll say that that is like any tenant base. As long as you're not like, you know, buying across the street from this house that's like uh, got 16 cars in the driveway and like a bunch of just red flags. I don't know. <laughs> Nicole, I know uh, you're mother of two. Uh, family's important to you. What has investing uh, meant to your family so far? Um, maybe how, how do you in- involve the kids if you do it all? And, and what's your goal? Like, what, what are some of your goals? What, what's real estate? What do you want real estate to do for your family? Yeah. So I guess my biggest goal for real estate is, is honestly to create generational wealth, to create a life for my kids and 
potentially their kids, kids and whatnot, but, um, but more so I'm thinking about, about thinking about them. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's like them living a life of like what they're passionate about, or if like my daughter right now, she's six and she says she wants to be a veterinarian. Well, I know veterinarian school is very expensive and I yeah. want to be able to make sure that my kids like don't have any sort of college debt or student loan debt or anything whenever they graduate. So, yep. um, you know, so I'm using real estate as a tool to plan ahead. I would say, mm-hmm. um, if they don't decide that they you know, college isn't for them, then I want them to have the option to start a business if that's what they want to do yeah, sure. or um, become musicians and not have to worry about where they're going to get their, their next meal. Like whatever it is that they're passionate about, I want them to be the best version of themselves. And so yeah. I'm using real estate as a tool in order to do that for them and really just kind of set them up. Um, another thing that is super important for me is like living a life of abundance. And it's not based on like material things and whatnot it's based on like time freedom if we want to go on vacation Mm -hmm. or we want to go do something I don't I want my investments to be able to pay for that so um yeah yeah, I'll say that it's it's taken some time I've I've tried to learn to be a little bit more patient with myself um but you know I also know too that very wealthy individuals have typically, I think on average is what, like seven to nine or something different income sources that are coming in. And so I always have that in the back of my mind is like, okay, what can I do to get us to that next level? Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. I've, you know, I've had the opportunity to be a stay at home mom for five, I guess kind of still am my little one's three. So he's only at school like three days a week. Right. So still mommy mode, but, yeah. um, my husband's in the oil and gas industry and it's a, it's a very cyclical industry where when it's great, it's great. And when it's not, you hope that you've prepared for the times where yeah. uh, you're yep. not necessarily going to struggle, but if there's pay cuts or yep. there's no bonuses, like, you know, just things like that. Different. So yep. I've just been using real estate as a great tool to be able to kind of recycle some of that money and invest so that we don't have to have any sort of worries and we can just kind of do what we want. Yeah. Yeah. I love the living life of, of abundance and everybody wants time freedom. It, it People just focus on the money, but it, it's, it's time freedom that they really want. And yeah. and there's a financial piece to that. I mean, you, you have to, you know, be <laughs> financially for the most part to, to do that unless you want to live out of a van uh, and, and travel the world. And some people do, but most people don't. Um, well, Nicole, so they're still young, six and three, but um, are you involving uh, the, the kids in the business at all? Do they, do they go to the property with you? Stuff like that? Yeah, they do. They oh, do. Cool. So we, it's funny, the, the rental house that, uh, that we had done, um, like that full gut on, we called it co- the construction house. So they still call it the construction house, even though it's sure. not under construction anymore, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah, no, they would come out and they, and they would see like, you know, they saw the house, um, when it was basically completely gutted down, they saw it when the flooring was going in, like they were there at different parts of the project. Um, But I think the biggest thing that I like to involve the kids in is having them go to these different communities that don't look like the one that we live in so that they can really feel grateful and feel appreciative of the life that they have. Um, Because no, like, I don't want snotty kids that are like, yeah, you know, my parents have this and that, like, they're nothing like that. And I don't ever want them to be that way. Oh, hundred percent. But it, it also takes showing them what other communities look like for them yep. to really see how other people live their life. Because our yes. community, and, and I'm sure yours and many of us that are investing too, we don't always live where we invest. It doesn't yep. mean that we, um, you know, we think anything less of the areas that we're investing in. It's just, that's just, I don't know, I guess, I don't know, maybe it's like the business plan or however you, however you formulated things. Yep. Um, but I do it to kind of open their eyes to see like oh, life, sure. not all roses and unicorns and all that fun yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, we do the same thing, Nicole. I, I love your heart behind that. And we, you know, we take our kids out to our properties and, and yeah, our, our properties for the most part are in, in C-class areas, maybe ones in B, but mostly C-class areas. And um, I mean, not only like it's a different community, but it's like, do you see like this family lives in an apartment, right? Like yeah. that's a small, you know, we, we're, incredibly blessed. I mean, we have a small house, but we've got a little bit of land because we kind of live in the country and like our kids have room to roam. Like, look at, you know, their room to roam is, is not their property. It's, it's, you know, around the property and maybe a park, like they live in an apartment. So yeah, g- giving them that perspective. I love that. And then I like being out there too. And like, you're picking up trash today. <laughs> this is what yeah. you're doing. You know, <laughs> you are not spoiled. We're here to pick up other people's trash 
Yep. That's what you're doing. We are not above doing anything. We're picking up trash today. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that you said that. Def- definitely that, but also too, like whenever they get to see like other kids and and how mm-hmm. they are and other mm-hmm. people, like it just opens their eyes. And I'll say like, I'll say this too. We were at, um, I was walking a house one day with a realtor and this was like my very first one that I had walked. I put an offer on it and I felt very strongly about like my cause behind it, which is why I ended up founding Wicked Holdings literally a yeah. month later. But um, but it was crazy because it was in probably like a C to C minus maybe neighborhood. And uh, this teenager had like rode by or maybe young adult, but he rode by on a lime green um, motorcycle, like a motorbike. Mm-hmm. And he did one of those wheelies like and he revved it and he went all the way down the street on one wheel. And my kids wow. were like, oh. Oh, like they were looking like, oh my gosh. Like, and my daughter, of course, is like, is he okay? Like, I don't want him to fall. And my son's like looking like, oh wow. But I was like, these are the things that you open their eyes to because they never would see that in our neighborhood. Yeah, so it's like right. get out there, like yep. experience some culture, experience Love different it. people. Like, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, we we've we've had similar experiences, <laughs> fun stuff. It's good. Yeah, I want my kids to be cultured be up beyond just our street and stuff. So that's awesome. Uh, as we're wrapping up here, Nicole, um, what's a good book recommendation? Uh, we mentioned Rich Dad Porter, but what, what maybe another book that people are, um, you know, wanting to get started in real estate or maybe they're into it, you know, want to read a good one. What have you read lately? Maybe. Um, okay. So I did just finish, let's see, is it a real, it's not really a real estate related oh, book, fine. but I do think that it would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of big into like, uh, kind of unconventional, unconventional thinking, um, sure. and just book that I just finished is called What Would the Rockefellers Do? And so it talks a little bit about like cash flow insurance and becoming your own bank. And these are really great tools that us as real estate professionals can use to our advantage. And and it really kind of dives deep into it, but it's basically how the Rockefellers versus the Vanderbilts had built their wealth and which ones kept it and which we all know that the Rockefellers did keep it generationally. And Vanderbilt yeah. So it's a very good comparison on, on that and how you can kind of like set up family banks and trusts for your kids. and, and Cool. Whatnot. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that recommendation. Um, and then also as we're wrapping up, I always like to ask just, just kind of a, in summary, what do you think is the key ingredient to being a successful real estate investor? Oh man, I would say mindset. I would sure. say that yeah. mindset and being persistent um, yeah. and not being afraid to take calculated risks and being okay with failure. Because yeah. I failed a lot on that first rental, like, and sure. it, and it yep. wasn't even like, you know, things that were obvious. It's just looking back on it now. I'm like, huh, did I really make the right choice with that contractor? Or did I really, you know, oh, yeah. so those, you just, you have to learn that real estate's not for the faint of heart and you just have to be okay with it. If you want oh, absolutely. to live a life, a little bit of a play on that, that question. What do you think is the key ingredient to, um, being a successful mom, wife, you know, person of faith, if that's important to you while having success in real estate? Making time for your family. Yeah. Would say How do you do that? What, what? Um, so like when my kids and stuff come home, like yeah. they come home, for example, right now they're at summer camp and they will be for the full summer. I'm still working, but they'll be home at two o'clock. So mm-hmm. I go and I pick them up and then I have time with my kids. So yesterday we went and we saw a great grandma. So my grandma, and mm-hmm. we went and we visited her until it was dinner time and we came home and Oh, and we had family awesome. time. So yep. um, just being very purposeful. And I know that sometimes it's, it's, not, um, it's not easy to shut things down, especially as entrepreneurs, because we don't yes. have a nine to five schedule. Like we're yep. always working. Yes. So I'm just mindful of like making sure that my kids know that I'm present. I spend time with them. And then if I still have things I need to do, then I do it when everyone goes to bed. Yeah, absolutely. It, you're right. It's hard to do as an entrepreneur because um, you don't clock in and clock out. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of times, we could be working around the clock. I mean, there's always more you can do, right? I mean, when you're, yes. when you're marketing and when you're um, trying to you find properties, I mean, we can never market too much or, or look at all the properties that are out there, right? Yeah. So with more, you're right. You, you have to shut it down and you have to, now it's family time. So it's mm-hmm. really good. I appreciate that. Um, hey, one thing I forgot to ask you, um, wh- where did Wicked Holdings come from? It's an interesting yeah. name. Like how, how did you get that name? Yeah, that's funny. I- I get that question often. Um, so you, I, we talked a little bit before that uh, I grew up in Canada, from Canada. Yeah. So 
wicked up north means like awesome, like super yeah. cool. Kind of like that word stoked that you hear and you're like, yeah, like that's rad or whatever. Yeah. So for me, wicked meant awesome. And it was something that I really wanted to not only embody like my company around, but also like the types of people that I associate myself with. And sure. so, yeah, it's just kind of like wicked holdings is like an awesome community. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I, I wonder if that's what it meant or I didn't know if like, you really like the play wicked. I mean, that, a lot of people. <laughs> on that. Like, I, I can't you know, say I've, I've, I've known that, but, but yeah, no, it just means that's just cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. An awesome community. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, good stuff, Nicole. Um, I, you know, I, I've got here, uh, as far as like social media and way people can reach out to you, you know, if they want to learn more about you, maybe invest with you, maybe, you know, just kind of follow you. Cause I, you're always putting out great content. It, I, I've got your LinkedIn profile. We'll put that in the uh, show notes. Is that the best place for people to connect with you? Yeah, that's definitely okay. the best place. Um, they can also go onto my website at uh, www.wicked-holdings.com. Okay. And on there, they can learn more about me, but I've also got a free guide too for people that are looking to get passively invested and they just oh, cool. to start um, yeah. on there as well. And it's easy to find. Awesome. Okay, we'll put all that in the show notes. Uh, this has been great, Nicole. Thank you so much for your time. Um, a lot of great stuff here. I, lo- I love your heart behind um, empowering others. Uh Give it, you know, you want financial independence for your family. You, I think you'd like to see other families, especially in underserved communities, for them to, to achieve financial independence or, or at least be on the path, right? Start making some uh, decisions that lead them toward that for their family. I, I love your heart behind that. Thank you for that. Um, before I let you go, I always like to ask our, our guests, um, how might my listeners and I be praying for you in the coming weeks? I honestly, I would just say uh, the best thing that we can do right now is just praying for health, like Mm -hmm. good health, um, mental health, as well as physical. Um, Because our minds can be totally beaten down in this industry and we can have a lot of like internal struggles. So um, yeah, I'd say mental health and clarity. Uh, Yeah. Well, great, great prayer. Thank Uh, you. Well, good stuff, Nicole. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a lot of fun. Really good stuff. Uh, Glad to have connected with you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another great episode. I hope you'll take action on what you've learned today. If you enjoyed today's show, please consider leaving Lee a five-star rating and review. And check him out on threefoldrei.com. Until next time, 1 Timothy 6.17.